to the Pelican Brief with your host, David Tatman. Welcome to the Pelican Brief. I'm joined today by John Cuvion. John is one of the premier pollsters in the state of Louisiana and across the country. John uh, launched his political consulting business, JMC Enterprises of Louisiana, in 2010. And in his capacity, he provides strategic consulting services to candidates uh, and to issue advocacy groups, uh, including public opinion, polling, voter targeting, redistricting, and what it takes to win analysis. I've worked with John personally in my campaigns, and so I know he's right on. He told us what the numbers would be, and that's what they were. His analysis have been recognized both locally and nationally by publications like uh, in Louisiana, like La Politics, uh, The Advocate, NOLA.com, and then the National Journal, National Review Online, Real Clear Politics, which is one of the real big polling uh, centers in the country, U.S. News and World Report, The Washington Post, and Reuters. Um, John works all over the country, not just in Louisiana. He works in 36 states and uh, works in federal, judicial, legislative, and local offices. And just a little bit of personal information, John's a native of Baton Rouge, uh, where he currently resides uh, with his wife. Outside of politics, he is also interested in cycling and weightlifting. So don't take it easy on me, John. Don't, don't, uh, Don't come out on me. So welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on today. Well, I appreciate you being here. And so, you know, we like to dive right down into uh, the the issues that are uh, that we're, you know, dealing with. And so you bring such great perspective as a pollster, as somebody who goes out and really has the pulse of the public. And it's just it's again, I'm so impressed with your work. But one of the big things we're talking about now, we're just about to move into a legislative session. We're about a month away. But people are already really diving into the governor's race, right? It's election year in Louisiana. Um, and, you know, you've already got some people out there. So let's talk about this. How do you see the field in the Louisiana governor's race shaping up? So the first thing to appreciate with the governor's race is the concept of what I would call the swim lanes which is you do have different ideological bandwidths, as it were, where the various candidates will fit. And the reason those bandwidths are important is that there's a certain percentage of the vote applicable to them. And appreciating that means you get a ticket to the runoff as opposed to being someone who fell short because you didn't understand kind of what swim lane you best fit in. So I like to think of Louisiana as having three swim lanes. You have the conservative side, you have the moderate side, and, of course, you have the Democratic side. Because even though Democrats have been winning fewer and fewer races at the statewide level, the plain reality is they are substantial enough to where their vote can land a candidate in the runoff. And, of course, technically you do have a Democratic voter registration plurality in the state. So having given you the general feel for the swim lanes – I'll start with the conservative swim lane. So Jeff Landry currently is someone I would consider in the conservative swim lane, as I would John Schroeder and as I would uh, Senator Sharon Hewitt. So in other words, both of them are speaking conservative rhetoric, and that rhetoric is designed to appeal to a certain segment of the vote. Now, the challenge is when you have three people competing in that same swim lane, the very real possibility of the vote being cut up. So that's how I see the conservative swim lane. The moderate swim lane currently is fairly empty. I would say Richard Nelson probably best fits that profile because even though he does typically vote with the Republicans, he is a fairly independent voice when it comes to more social-type issues. And so I would not fi- uh, picture him in the same swim lane as I would Jeff Landry or John Schroeder or Sharon Hewitt. Then finally, on the Democratic side, well, first they need to find a candidate. But as we speak right now, the district attorney of East Baton Rouge Parish, a gentleman named Hill and Moore, he took himself out of the race. He potentially could have gotten some votes because being that he's from the largest parish in the state and the fact that the East Baton Rouge Parish media market is 20 percent of the state, that could have given him a good vote base, but he did not choose to run. So right now, everybody's waiting on Sean Wilson, who is the secretary of transportation and development and if assuming he's the only major democrat running that would definitely give him a percentage of the vote which almost certainly would put him into the runoff so then the question becomes given these three swim lanes 
and the fact that I think the conservative swim lane is fairly crowded, I do think you have a market opportunity, as it were, in this moderate Republican swim lane where the candidate who can dominate that swim lane can make the race competitive. But right now, I would say the odds are the odds are that assuming Sean Wilson gets into the race, he would likely become the de facto Democratic candidate, and Jeff Landry would currently have the lead on the Republican side. The question becomes, of course, we're talking about this at the end of February slash early March, what's going to happen come qualifying? So this is kind of one of those discussions that probably would need to revisit one or two months down the road. But that's where things stand right now with regard to the governor's race. Yeah, I think that's great information. And of course, that's the way the canvas lays out right now, right? That's the way it looks. And But there's still a few players out there, right? There's still some people who could jump into this race and make a splash. And so tell me a little bit about how you see, you know, and look, we're, we, we may call them late entrants, but there's still time, right? There's still time to make a difference. There's still time to make a difference. I would say for the governor's race, because of the sheer money involved to be able to run a credible campaign, I do think the window is closing faster than it would, say, on the lieutenant governor's race or the attorney general's race or another one of those down-ballot races. Having said that, right now everybody's watching to see what Congressman Garrett Graves will do because his, his rhetoric and positioning, I would say, arguably puts him more in that moderate swim lane. And the interesting thing about that is he represents a, di- represents a district that is coterminous with the uh, Baton Rouge media market, which again is 20% of the state, and I think would be a substantial electoral base for him to start off with if he were to decide to run. The question mark with regards to Congressman Graves' is running is, number one, it's been a couple months since a formal decision has been made by him as to what he wants to do, and number two, the fact that Speaker Kevin McCarthy has given him a really plumb position. So that is going to be an interesting you know, case of Will he run or won't he? The other name, and he has surfaced really uh, within the last day, would be the Speaker of the House, Clay Schechtschneider. So I would suspect you have several people of that caliber who are mulling whether to run. And you're certainly correct in that it's not like the window is closed because, of course, qualifying is five months away. But I do think from a fundraising perspective that you really want to let donors know sooner rather than later that you're interested in running because not just the fact that it takes time to get accelerate your fundraising and make sure you have enough cash on hand to be able to go the long stretch but also too while all this is going on the world is continuing to operate meaning donors are making decisions on candidates in the race not candidates who may want to be in the race yeah so let me ask you something does does the decision by district attorney hill or moore uh, does it impact uh, Garrett Grace's decision? I don't think it would because even though both of them are from East Baton Rouge Parish, the fact that he's a Democrat and the fact that Congressman Grace is a Republican, I don't think there would have been a lot of overlap in their vote other than perhaps a few precincts close to LSU. But I think the bigger issue is that Hiller Moore's, uh, I guess, definite statement of non-interest, shall we say, makes life easier for Sean Wilson because if you're a Democratic donor – you're thinking, well, maybe I have two or perhaps even three people to choose from. Now it looks like only Sean Wilson is the person who has expressed a possible interest. So I just, you know, from a logistical standpoint, and look, I know you you are great at confidentiality of your own polls, so I'm going to talk about polls broadly, right? Not yours, but other ones that have been popping up here and there. What is what is your sense of the undecided vote right now? Is it super high? I would say it's in the middle range, about 30 percent, which is not terribly surprising for a race that has not really developed yet and a race where people aren't yet focused. And 30 percent is – and by the way, that is something I have seen in just about every poll I'm conducting at whatever geographical level is it typically is about 30 percent. I would say that it's – it's across the board right now, but I think that the biggest kind of uh, undecided voter would be what I would call that that more moderate voter by Louisiana standards. So would those be independents or really more moderate Republicans or a combination of those? I'd say more moderate Republicans, but there would be some independents in there, meaning that they would probably vote Republican, but you cannot count on them in every single election. I mean, perfect example was 
Governor Edwards owes his victory and his reelection to the ability to get an appreciable number of Republicans and or independents in the more populous parishes to support him. Yeah, so I guess uh, the other, I guess, question I was going to ask, and this is more about, you know, there was, there's was there been some positioning and some jockeying relative to the Republican Party's endorsement. Do you, do you, how do you think that cuts in the end? I mean, what, what do you think the impact of that is in the end? It's something that in the short term has benefited Jeff Landry because the average person doesn't really understand the intricacies of party endorsements. And so if you are someone in Jeff Landry's position, you could easily say, I'm the endorsed Republican candidate for governor, which technically is true. But of course, we don't have party primaries. So from a practical standpoint, that's not a true statement. But I think in the short term, it does benefit him in terms of being able to say that and being able to uh, use that line with potential donors. Mm -hmm. So if the race were today, and I know I'm putting you on the spot, but if the race were today, what do you think it would line up like? I mean, I, you know, I don't see anybody with that many bodies in the race and geographical preferences and all those sorts of things. I mean, you're probably talking about something that, what, somebody would be in the 20s, high 20s, maybe somebody in the low 20s, and that's your runoff? Or are you seeing somebody, are you thinking a Jeff Landry in the first could run in, in the 40s? I'd say more likely than not there'd be a runoff. Now, with regards to how high Jeff Landry can go, there's obviously a couple of variables which in late February slash early March we can't really confidently assess. Number, number one, what will the migration of donors be in terms of money going to him relative to his Republican challengers? Number two, are there any other people wanting to run? Number three, the Democrat or Democrats still have to make their intentions known. So there's things like that that still need some settling. I would think more likely than not there would be a runoff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be hard to win in the first in an open race like that. I mean, an open seat, right? right. Um, but it'll be interesting. You know, a lot of, uh, in, in my world, in the political world that I live in, a lot of people say the person who's going to win the governor's race is not yet in it. But the real question is who is that person, right? right. And so it's just really difficult uh, to pull that together. Well, look, we're going to keep an eye on the governor's race, obviously. And there are some other statewide races that you and I will talk about. And as mm -hmm. you come on and we talk about races as they develop, uh, I know there's been a couple of changes to some races today, in fact. Yes. Uh, and so, but to, we, I will, I, I may, we may try to spend a little bit of time on each of those races to give our audience uh, the full grasp of things. So I know that's what's in front of us. We still have a legislative session to go through at least if there's, you know, if there wouldn't be any special or anything like that. And then we'll have fall elections and we'll figure out where Louisiana is going to be. But shortly after that, and really, it won't be a year, right? That we'll start seeing presidential activity in the fall, and you know, because Louisiana is an off-year election, right. it's a little bit different for us. But let's talk a little bit about the presidential race, because at least on the Republican side, it seems to be heating up a little bit. Can you share with me some of your perspective? Because you do have a national perspective. You work in thirty-six states. What are you hearing and seeing across the country? Well, the first thing I want to address, I will talk about the. I hate to say elephant in the room, but it is a subject where you can get people uh, with considerable disagreement. That is what the polls are saying. And my attitude about the polls is they're all over the map right now. And so a lot of that dependent is dependent on, number one, what area is being polling, polled. Are we talking about polling nationally versus polling the early states versus polling Iowa, et cetera, et cetera? Number two, I would say the definition of the Republican primary voter. In other words, what kind of screening questions are asked? What kind of analysis are we doing to determine that that person is a quote-unquote Republican voter? So given those intangibles, you know, some polls are showing Trump ahead. Some polls are showing Florida Governor Ron DeSantis ahead. I don't really take any of that seriously right now. I'm really kind of considering the overall concepts. The overall concept is this. It's Donald Trump versus the rest of the Republican field. Now, assuming that Florida Governor Ron DeSantis jumps in, and it's probably more likely than not he does, but it, sound, it seems like right now he wants to sit back and wait, at least until the legislative session in Florida is concluded in June. But having said that and assuming that DeSantis were to get in, I think he would be the most formidable challenger to Donald Trump because the challenge the Republicans have nationally and, of course, in multiple states is that you have to draw – there has to be a fine line between co-opting the rhetoric that President Trump has 
versus trying to pander to him or to be overtly against him. If you're overtly against him, I think that does have a bad effect on you with regards to getting support from Republican primary voters. A perfect example is the Republican governor of Maryland, Larry Hogan, who's putting himself in the Never Trump camp. Well, that may help you get reelected governor of Maryland in a general election, but it's certainly not going to help you win Republican primary voters. But then you have people like, say, Ron DeSantis, who they're basically kind of straddling the fence, as it were, you know, and, and you could tell the Trump campaign clearly thinks of Governor DeSantis as a threat because almost every day there is a new social media posting where he's finding something, you know, nasty to say about Governor DeSantis. And I'm thinking, OK, if the mud's already flying this early, obviously there's a level of concern they have about him being formidable relative to some of the other Republican candidates in the race. So having given you kind of like the overall, I guess, structure of the presidential race, Another law of physics, which I think is applicable here, is given that we don't have runoffs in presidential primaries, if you have a lot of candidates all jumping into the race thinking they can beat Donald Trump, that, di that dilutes the quote-unquote anti-Trump Republican vote. And I do think there is a solid vote that Donald Trump will have regardless of whether he has one or ten opponents. So if you have a crowded field of, say, 10 people running, he theoretically could go from primary to primary with 30 percent of the vote, and he is, quote, unquote, winning. Whereas if you have one or two credible challengers and everyone else gets ignored, well, that's an entirely different uh, race in terms of if President Trump or former President Trump, rather, could pull it out. And so that's what's going to be the interesting dynamic to me is as time goes on, what's the trend of the polls and or where are the donors going because you could clearly tell there is a group of people who want to support DeSantis because they think of him as the best alternative to Trump. But that, of course, means that DeSantis has to jump in. And the further and further along in the year we get without him jumping in, these donors are going to get nervous and may start looking elsewhere. So all of that taken together is, to me, kind of what to watch for the Republican race. I think it will start getting really hot once we get into the summer. Because if you are not an announced presidential candidate by the summer, well, you need even more time to raise money and build an organization than you would if you were running for governor of Louisiana. Yeah, it would. It definitely seems like it's a lot. So what about – so, you know, I remember uh, last time there was so many Democrat yes. con, uh, uh, candidates that they had to have two separate – debates, right? <laughs> right. Is that, yeah. The adults' and, table and the children's table. Yeah, I like that. I like that. So let me ask you, do you expect to see the same sort of uh, lineup on the Republican side? Do you expect to see that many candidates, or do you think because of Trump it will be a little bit more limited? I'm thinking somewhere in the 5 to 10 candidate range. I mean, yeah, technically you could have 20-plus people running, but I'm talking about in terms of serious candidates who could poll, say, at least 5% in the early states. Okay. So what about the Democratic side? I mean, The Democratic side is much simpler. What's kind of interesting there is even though the Democrats are nervous about President Biden, I think the fact that the Democrats broke even in the 2022 midterms gives President Biden some bi uh, breathing room in terms of nobody with any kind of gravitas is going to take on an incumbent president. So right now he's drawn a challenger, a lady named Marianne Williamson, who some may remember she ran for president in 2020. She got maybe like three-tenths of a percent of the vote in New Hampshire and Iowa. She technically withdrew from the race before New Hampshire and Iowa, but of course it was too late to take her name off the ballot. So point being is Joe Biden doesn't have to worry very much about that. Although what will be interesting to me, kind of like what happened with Barack Obama in 2012, is – given that there will be somebody else but Joe Biden on the Democratic primary ballot, what kind of a protest vote there will be in various states. Because one of the things we saw in the Obama race was, even though in a lot of states the Democratic Party apparatus prevented any other challengers from being on the ballot, in the states where the challenger was on the ballot, we did see a substantial percentage of the vote, like in places like Kentucky and West Virginia, that actually voted for, I think one of the guys running against him was a convicted felon, and yet he got a substantial percentage of the vote. And that, to me, was indicative of the realignment that was starting occur to occur with regards to these Democrats in that part of the country. So I see the same kind of thing happening with President Biden, where there will be a protest vote. The question is if it's a 5 percent protest vote versus 30 percent. 
So one of the uh, conversations that keeps coming up is if it is Joe Biden, will uh, will Vice President Harris be his running mate? In Almost the next certainly. Time? Almost certainly. Right? Because that's one of those things where if, let's say, you were to take a vice president off the ticket, number one, that calls into mind your judgment for picking that person to begin with. And number two, almost nothing good comes out of that kind of removal from the ticket because you better believe there'd be hard feelings. So I think for good or for ill, depending on your point of view, that you might as well go ahead and print those Biden-Harris 2024 signs as we speak because it's extremely unlikely that he would remove her from the ticket. So the early money right now, and I know you don't usually do this, but the early money would be on a Trump-Biden rematch, you think? Slightly more likely than not. The question becomes, if Governor DeSantis were to jump in, to what extent will we start having a genuinely competitive race? Because the other thing about President Trump's strength, he has a certain share of the vote. The question is if that certain share can increase or becomes further diluted. Mm -hmm. So I guess the other question I would have is, is, uh, is there a, a significant or legitimate candidate who, from the Democrat side that would run against Joe? I don't think so. I mean, two possibilities, and this is extremely remote. You have the Democratic governors of California and Illinois who they're clearly interested in moving up. The question is if they would risk their careers by doing something as bold as taking on an incumbent president, because almost nothing good comes from someone within your party agreeing to take an incumbent on. Yeah. So we have, uh, obviously, Trump's running. Uh, Maybe DeSantis, Nikki Haley's announced. Correct. And who else? Uh, Senator think? Tim Scott. Yes, Tim Scott. No, I actually know Tim. A uh, great guy, uh, great, great senator from the from the great state of South Carolina, and a, a really strong uh, leader. Uh, other names I've heard: uh, Governor Asa Hutchinson, former Governor Asa Hutchinson of Arkansas, uh, Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas. I would say Larry Hogan, the former Republican governor of Maryland, is pretty much going to run. So I would expect several of those can oh uh, I'll make sure I get my first name right, John Bolton, the former national security advisor. So you have a lot of those people of that caliber who I would assume they're gonna run. The question is, okay, how do you go from zero percent to a, a statistically significant percent? In other words, there's gotta be some breakout moment in debate or something like that to where people be willing to give you a second look. Yeah. No, I I uh, think it's gonna be uh it's going to be exciting. I mean, you know, it's going to be uh, it's going to be interesting. It's also going to be ugly. Yes, know, getting back to uh, all of what we see. And of course, we'll see that in the governor's race and some of the statewide races. But um, politics has turned pr particularly competitive. Um, yeah. yeah, competitive <laughs> and and ugly. Right? Yeah. There's a lot of personal attacks out there. You think it's worse now than it was, say, 20 years ago? Well, I think what amplifies it is that. When you have social media, it makes it much easier for just anybody to chime in with an attack. And the question then becomes, will it necessarily go viral and it becomes an issue that the candidate has to deal with? Yeah. And so I, I guess I'm, I'm going to just ask you a couple of questions. You know, when I was a, a youngster, which was a long time ago, uh, direct mail was king, right? You would go out there and, you know, there was lots of other things. You give out fans and emery boards and pencils or whatever, depending on the size of the race. And now social media is obviously big. Digital is really big. Do you do you think uh, direct mail still wields the same weight that it once did, or are the, is it now a combination of uh, communication platforms to get to the voters? I would say more digital. Direct mail to me has its place, but I see that place more at a local level, as opposed to you know trying to do a mailer to say everybody in a swing state. The cost that it would take to do that and or all the execution steps of getting the mail going to all those swing state voters, you could have long since done some kind of a digital campaign and probably, you know, gotten the same bang for your buck, if not more. So I think direct mail has its place, but I'm not convinced it's at the presidential level. Yeah. yeah and, and I think it's just really interesting to know because, you know, th everyone has so much more data on us, right? Yes. All of our all of our algorithms and all of the things that uh, that happen, and so I, I think it's 
it's uh, interesting and to watch it. And look, I like watching that part of it. I don't like watching the negative ads, but I do like watching how they target me, yes. seeing what I get. And I'm like, I wonder why I got that. You know, why did that pop up on my Google feed, for example? And, um, you know, I know they're always watching. So, well, well, John, are there any other things we want to cover before we uh, wrap up? Anything else you want to cover? One of the things I think will be interesting, too, Louisiana certainly is the marquee governor's race this year. You also have governor's races going on in Kentucky and uh, Mississippi, and each of them has their own little interesting twist. In Kentucky, it's a case of, just like with what Governor Edwards experienced in 2019, you have an incumbent Repub uh, Democratic governor who has high approval ratings, but the Democratic Party label drove that person's numbers down. That's going to be the dynamic in Kentucky, which has its primary in May. In Mississippi, the challenge there is you have a Republican governor who there are a substantial number of people who don't like him for whatever reason, and he's drawn a credible Democratic challenger whose last name happens to be Presley. <laughs> and so, you know, what's interesting about that is this, this is a race where I think that definitely the Democratic candidate is going to get a, a second look by the voters. The question is if that second look can enable you to go from, say, 45, 47 percent to 51. So there'll be other interesting governor's races than just ours. Right. So you're, you're working in, a, in other states, too, this year. Are you working in some other states with uh, some of the other? Uh, you, well, I mean, it's still a little bit early, but are you doing any work in those other states? Things always come when yeah. I least expect it. Oh, so. You may not be able to tell me, right, so I'm right. good with that. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I remember right. the days when I used to hire the uh, outside consultants. So, John, tell us how uh, our audience can get in touch with you if they want to hire a good pollster or somebody to work with their organization. Certainly. So I like to uh, – Twitter is my favorite social media platform, so I'm at, at winwithjmc, and I'm also john at winwithjmc.com. Great. Well, and then so uh, reach out to John. I think he's one of the best in the business um, and he does so much more. It's not just, uh, you know, necessarily political races. Right. You work with groups and organizations, Correct. Some of my organizations and other organizations to really get the pulse of what's going on in the state and what people really think about things as opposed to what may be portrayed by the media or by statements by individuals. And you do a lot of that kind of work too, don't you? Correct. And what's interesting about polling is there's so much more to it than just, say, horse race polling in a political race because you could have issue polling. You could have uh, another interesting application be jury profiling. So polling can cover the gamut of things besides just political races. And, you know, the thing I like about issue polling the most is – it gives you a unique insight into voters, and you can appreciate nuances such as if you were po polling on the abortion issue, which is something that, in my opinion, I think the Republicans' failure to understand the two-dimensional mindset people have about abortion, failure to understand that, I think, cost them quite a few seats in the midterms last year. Yeah, no doubt about it. And look, again, I, I enjoy working with you. I think you're really great at what you do. So. Um, we are the Pelican Brief. Um, we are on social media uh, at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Our, uh, our handle on all three of those is at Pelican Brief 225. That's at Pelican Brief 225. Our email address is uh, the Pelican Brief 225 at gmail.com. Please like, uh, share, and subscribe. You know the rules. If you have a good take, uh, we will uh, mention you on the show. If you have a great take, you're going to come back and be a guest. So thank you all for uh, being here, and we'll see you next time on the Pelican Brief. <laughs>